Hey there, welcome back to our channel. If you watched our previous video, you'll remember that we demonstrated how to create a 3D sphere with wireframe using WebDPU. However, when it comes to rendering objects with solid colors, the resulting image might seem flat and fail to capture the true 3D nature of the object. This happens because there is no interaction between light and the object surfaces. Lighting plays a crucial role in producing visually realistic 3D graphics that accurately represent the objects. While lighting is indeed crucial, it's important to note that WebKP lacks built-in features for handling lighting. Instead, it provides two main functions, a vertex shader and a fragment shader. To achieve the desired lighting effects in your 3D scene, you'll need to write your own lighting functions. This involves creating a custom lighting model tailored to your specific requirements. By taking control of the lighting process, you can achieve the desired results and enhance the realism of your 3D graphics. In the upcoming series of videos, we will delve into several lighting models in WebDPU. Our goal is to showcase how these models can be utilized to simulate light sources and their interaction with objects within the scene. As you can observe, this object showcases the presence of a lighting effect. We can break down the interaction of light into three distinct components, ambient, diffuse, and specular. The ambient light uniformly influences all surfaces and can be considered as the background illumination in the environment. Diffuse lighting entails the direct illumination of an object by an evenly distributed light, resulting in interactions with the surface. This component serves as the primary contributor to the object's brightness and forms the foundation for its color. The specular lighting component provides objects with a glossy shine and produces highlighted areas. It generates bright spots on objects, enhancing their visual appeal. The reflection of light depends on the angle at which it interacts with the surface. This angle holds significant importance for both the diffuse and specular lights. This angle is associated with the surface normal which is perpendicular to the face of the object. To construct a lighting model, it is crucial to calculate the surface normal based on the orientation of the surface. Calculating surface normals for a cube is relatively straightforward. Let's consider the cube's faces individually. The front face, which points towards the screen, has a normal of 0, 0, 001. The right face, facing to the right, has a normal of 100. Zero, zero. The top face, pointing upwards, has a normal of 010. Zero, zero. Similarly, we can specify the normals for the back, left, and bottom faces. It's important to note that the length of a normal vector should always be 1, so normalizing the vector is necessary. For a unit sphere, determining the normal vectors is even simpler. Each normal vector is identical to the corresponding vertex position on the surface. In spherical coordinate system notation, it can be expressed in the form as shown here. When dealing with the cylinder, we can divide its surface into three parts, the top face, the bottom face, and the curved tube. The normals for the top and bottom faces are 0, 1, 0, and 0, negative 1, 0 respectively. As for the curved tube, the normal vector can be expressed in the form. To calculate the normal vector at any point on a simple 3D surface, we can use a formula that represents the point on the surface. In this formula, the y-coordinate is a function of the x and z-coordinates. By taking the cross product of the partial derivatives, we can determine the normal vector at that point on the surface. The cross product calculation is straightforward, and here are the results. On the other hand, for a parametric 3D surface, we can represent a point on the surface that define the x, y, and z coordinates as functions of parametric variables u and v. In this case, 
The normal vector at the point is obtained by taking the cross product of the partial derivatives with respect to the parametric variables. Using these methods, we can accurately calculate the normal vector at any given point on both simple and parametric 3D surfaces. Once we have determined the normal vector at a point, we can use it along with the direction of the incident light to calculate the lighting intensity. For diffuse light, the intensity is proportionate to the cousin of the angle between the light vector and the normal vector. Let's denote the diffuse intensity as ID and the diffuse material property as KD. The relation between them can be expressed as follows. To prevent negative values, the max function is employed to ensure the cousin alpha term remains non-negative. Additionally, we can incorporate the ambient light to enhance the overall intensity of the diffuse light. This can be achieved by adding the ambient light intensity, denoted as IA, to the diffuse light intensity. When it comes to the specular light, there are two commonly used models. The first one is the FOM model, which is relatively simple to implement. It can be expressed using this formula, where IS represents the specular intensity, KS is the specular material property, and S is the specular exponent that determines the surface's shininess or roughness. However, the FOM model has a limitation in that the angle between the view direction and the reflection direction must be less than 90 degrees for the specular FOM term to contribute. To overcome this issue, we can employ the Blin FOM model, which uses a different set of vectors based on the half angle vector, denoted as H. The blend fawn model formula is N dot H, wherein represents the surface normal and H is constructed using the light vector and the view vector. By using the blend fawn model, we ensure that the angle between N and H is always less than 90 degrees, allowing for consistent and accurate specular lighting calculations. All right, let's dive into the programming aspect now. We will start with the project we worked on in our last video. If you already have the project on your local machine, simply open it using Visual Studio Code. If not, don't worry, you can easily download the project from our GitHub repository using the command git clone followed by the branch name and the repository URL link. This will download the project onto your local machine. Simply open this project using Visual Studio Code and then use the command npm install to install all npm packages required by this example. Now let's implement the light model and the shader code. Add a new vertex shader file called shadervert.wgsl file to the section Sierra 2 folder. This file will be reused for different light models. Pass the code to this file. In this code, we begin by passing three uniform matrices, view project metrics, model metrics, and normal metrics to the vertex shader. The input variables pause and normal represent the original vertex data and normal data, respectively. The output variables v position and v normal, defined within the output structure, hold the transformed vertex data and normal data which we will pass to the fragment shader for lighting calculation. Next, create a new fragment shader file called blendfongfrag.wtsl in the section 02 folder and insert the following code into it. Within the fragment shader, we'll define two uniform structures, light uniforms and material uniforms. The light uniforms structure is used to pass the VAC4 F-type fields such as the light and eye positions as well as the object and specular light colors. On the other hand, material uniforms will pass the material parameters of F32 type, which are used for lighting computation. Additionally, you can combine these two structures into one to achieve the same lighting effect. The light calculation inside the FS main function is straightforward. We first define various vectors, such as N, L, and V, as explained earlier. Then, 
We invoke the Blinfon function to compute the light contribution from the diffuse and specular sources. The Blinfon function implements the Blinfon lighting model. It is worth noting that the ambient light is taken into account by simply adding the material ambient constant to the diffuse light term. Now, we'll use the sphere as an example to test our Blinfon light model. Add a new type of script file named spherebleinfon.ts and paste the code to the file. This example follows a similar structure to the one used in the previous video. Inside the create pipeline function, we generate two render pipelines. One for creating the sphere shape and another for creating the wireframe. For each pipeline, we use two elements to configure the vertex buffers, with the first element containing the vertex position and second containing the normal vector data. We then construct the corresponding buffers using the position, normal, and index data. We proceed by defining three uniform buffers for transform traces, light, and material parameters, as well as two bind groups, each with a different layout. One bind group is used for vertex shader, while the other is used for fragment shader. To render our 3D sphere with lighting, we need to set the position, normal, and index buffers, along with two bind groups to the render pass in the draw function. Within the run function, we write the initial data for the light and eye positions to the light uniform buffer. We also include the light and material parameters in the depth DUI control to enable the specification of contributions from various light sources. Adjusting the parameters allows you to obtain different types of lighting, such as ambient, diffuse, and specular lighting. Inside the frame sub function, we update the view projection matrix whenever the user manipulates the camera with the mouse. We also need to update the uniform buffers whenever the model metrics, light, or material parameters change. To update the uniform buffers correctly, we must ensure that the offsets are set correctly. As we did in the previous video, when the input parameters such as the sphere's radius and the number of UV segments are modified, we need to regenerate the vertex data for the sphere. Since the vertex data has changed, we must update the DPU buffers with the new vertex data. This is achieved using the update vertex buffers function implemented in our web DPU simplified package. Now, let's proceed to add this example to the navigation menu. Open the side nav.html file from the src html folder and add the following link blindfold model. Once we have done, we can proceed to build and compile the code by executing the command in pm run prot in the terminal window. Then, clicking on the go lift to open the default web browser and view our sphere with lighting in action. This example allows for the manipulation of light model parameters. For instance, if we set the ambient parameter to 1, and both the diffuse and specular parameters to zero, you will get only ambient lighting. Similarly, you can obtain pure diffuse or specular lighting by setting the other two components to zero. To achieve mixed lighting, you can set a small value such as 0.1 for ambient and set values for diffuse and specular in the middle of the zero and one. For the specular lighting, you can also set the light color and shininess. A small shininess, such 5 represents a rough surface, while a large value such as 300 represents a metallic surface. You can also change the plot type to display both sphere and wireframe, sphere only, or wireframe only. You can also manipulate the other parameters such as radius and the UV segments. Now, let's conclude today's video. In the next installment, we will discuss the point light models in WebDPU. Make sure to stay tuned for that upcoming video. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you found it informative and helpful for your WebDPU development journey. 
If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more exciting content. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them down below. Until next time, happy coding.